Did you commit on GitHub? Oh no, I didn't commit this yet. I, I will though. Uh, okay. I didn't really read it over, so we'll see what um, spelling errors and things we find here. Um, yeah, okay, but good job. <laughs> yeah, thanks. Um, yeah, this was a good experience for me because um, I got experience with book down and um, uh, writing things in LaTeX and that sort of thing, um, which I don't usually get to do. But yeah, LaTeX is super useful. Don't 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 listen to the people said it's bad. It's bad, <laughs> but it's useful. Yeah, I've already used it quite a bit now. Um, so yeah, it's coming handy. Um, but for this chapter, uh, we'll be covering posterior inference and prediction. Um, this is a pretty important part because up until this point, we've been uh, creating a lot of uh, posterior distributions, right? Um, but up until this point, we haven't really um, extracted or learned how to extract all the right information from it to use to make inferences for our publications or whatever it may be. Um, and so for the learning objectives for this chapter are to establish the theoretical foundations for the three main tasks of posterior analysis, which is estimation, hypothesis testing, and prediction. And then the next section, we'll talk about how to use um, Markov chain simulations and MCMC um, to approximate posterior features um, and hence to use this in our posterior analysis. Um, and we'll start um, just like the beginning of the chapter started with a toy example. And we're going to pretend that we're in the Museum of Modern Art, which is in uh, New York City. And I just pulled up this random image of it. It looks pretty nice inside. Um, so it's a bunch of modern art. Um, so imagine that you're looking at the work of an artist and you ask yourself, um, what are the chances that this modern artist is, or that this artist that's that has their piece in this museum is Gen X or younger. Um, or in other words, what's the chances that they're born in 1965 or later? Because even though it's called modern art, some of this art dates back to like, what, the 18th uh, century. And so um, this is the toy research question we're gonna try and answer. Um, we'll try to infer the proportion um, of artists in the US or in US modern art museums that are Gen X or younger. And this proportion is um, what we're gonna call pi moving forward. So that's the param unknown parameter we're gonna try um, and estimate. Um, since we're not too certain, we're gonna start with the prior model for pi um, with a beta distribution of four six. Since our alpha and beta parameters are pretty low, um, this reflects um, uncertainty in our guess. And this represents our assumption that modern art museums display more artists born before 1965. In other words, that pi is less than 0.5. So we'll continue with our example and we'll sample 100 artists and find that um, 14 in our sample are Gen X or younger. Um, and then we'll go through updating this into our posterior model. And then it looks like this. So the area shading green is our posterior. Um, since um, our prior, we were pretty uncertain, It's our posterior is heavily weighted or um, influenced by the data. And so we see here that um, so far, it looks like it's around, our estimate of pi is around 16 or 15%. Um, or our posterior distribution tells us that less than 25% of artists are Gen X. As you can see here, this is sort of like the upper bound of our distribution. Um, so now that we've done this and we've learned how to do this in previous chapters, um, we have to perform a posterior analysis. And as I said before, um, we'll do estimation, hypothesis testing, and prediction, and cover um, what each of these mean um, in each section. All right, so we'll start with a quiz on posterior estimation. Um, and so since we had that uh, posterior distribution we talked about in the last slide, how should we describe our posterior estimate of pi? Um, is it A, roughly 16% of museum artists are Gen X or younger? Or B, it's most likely that around 16% of museum artists are Gen X or younger, but that figure could plausibly be anywhere between 9 and 26%. Um, unlike previous presenters, I won't put people on the spot, but you're more than welcome to chime in or put your answers in the chat or your guesses. Well, this one is a bit easy. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, this is, I should have come up with a harder one um, myself. Yeah. 
Um, but you could argue that technically both of them are right. It's just that yes. the force is more appropriate um, because it takes into account that uncertainty as people here um, could probably guess. And so um, a beta 1892 posterior model um, is shown here on the left and the alternative um, beta 1416 posterior model is shown on the right. Um, we might touch on those later. Um, but anyways, the answer is B. Um, because posterior estimates should reflect both the central tendency and variability in our parameters. Um, so to capture the central tendency, we can um, calculate the posterior mean and mode. Um, ooh, this didn't translate properly. But anyways, that would have been for the mode. Um, <laughs> the, the mode is just minus one, I think, on the denominators, no? Something um, like that. Yes, for like the beta. Yeah, I'll have to pull up the formula again, but I think that's fine. But yeah, you, you get the main idea. Yeah, yeah. Mean and mod usually are pretty close, but mm -hmm. also. Yeah, yeah. For sure, especially under like uh, symmetric yeah. distributions or normal distributions. Um, so to capture the variability in pi, which will be a recurring theme, by the way, um, how do I account for this uncertainty or variability in our parameters or our data, um, we can report the posterior credible interval. And so this is the first big term that we're gonna wanna know and understand well. So this is the range of plausible posterior values. Um, we typically calculate this by taking the 2.5th and 97.5th posterior percentiles. Um, and that range covers 95% of posterior plausible pi values. And I mean, as, you can um, probably guess um, because if you count all the way from the 2.5th to 97.5th, that's 95 percentiles in between. And those are the most plausible um, values for pi, at least based on our posterior distribution. Um, we do that with the Q beta function, which comes with the stats package in R. And we find that here it's between 0.1 and 0.24 in this case. Um, this region is shaded. I think this, this is the first time we use the um, quantile function. Oh, yeah. So it's good like to memorize it a bit. Uh, every quantile function for every distribution can start with Q. Mm -hmm. Yep. So that's make... right. Yep. And to add to that, we'll later in the chapter, and I'm sure just later in, in life, we're going to use the P beta or P distribution to get that area under the curve. Um, yeah as well. And so you're right, these are two important letters. Um, actually, I guess all of them are, you know, R norm for the random number generation. Um, we're getting the density with D. So all of these um, are important functions to know this family. Um, but yeah, so the resulting 95% credible interval is 0.1 to 0.24. And the region is shaded and displayed in the above figure. So I believe it's this one on the left. Yep. And so where's the area under the curve for the posterior PDF is one, the area of the shaded region. So the fraction of plausible pi values is 0.95 um, because this is the 95% um, credible interval. Um, and it can be represented with um, this equation. Um, Honestly, I've only learned calculus through like secondhand like textbooks, like looking at this and trying to interpret and read what the equations are. Um, but um, yeah, this calculates the area under the curve essentially. I'm bad at it, but I will try to uh, improve. I, I posted on the red for the test, uh, uh, for the test science, like some link about it. Okay. Of the, um, so it is possible to improve on that. But I, uh, I think like for this part of calculus, like you, it's basically an integral over the two, uh, is it integral in English also? Yes. Uh, over like the bound of 0.1 and 0.24 uh, times the function, times the derivative of the function, something like that. No, the derivative of pi, sorry. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Which is, I don't know. No, I, th I mean, <laughs> to a non-calculus person, that sounds right to me from the few YouTube videos I've watched. But yeah, we're integrating over pi, um, the area under the curve, where under this function is 0.95. Um, An integration is just basically a bunch of, I mean, it's a bunch of addition, like, mm -hmm. again. Yeah. Um, 
And we can also create a 99% credible interval, or for that matter, any number we want, right? 10% or 50%. Um, if it's a 50% credible interval, the range of the interval is from the 25th to the 75th. Um, and this would focus on a smaller range of plausible pi values, as you can imagine, because it's, it's thinner. Um, again, um, we come back to this Q beta function in which we would get the 50% credible interval. Um, and I guess the typical standard is to use 95%. Um, but for whatever reason, um, you might want to um, use a different range. Um, and so maybe we can talk more about that later, use cases where you can justify to say reviewers using a different credibility interval or a different confidence interval for that matter. Um, but that, that can be a discussion for later. Um, so how do we interpret this uh, credibility interval? Um, sorry, every time I see CI, I think confidence interval, so I have to remind myself. Um, but unlike a confidence interval, I would argue this, um, this CI is much more easily interpretable and intuitive um, because a 50% um, CI or credible interval would mean there's a 50% posterior probability that somewhere between 14 and 19% of museum artists are Gen X or younger. Um, and so um, to the left, yeah, this would be the 50% credible interval here. And so I'll just quickly contrast this to confidence intervals, which I still have a hard time defining, but it, it basically talks about the long run procedure or long run error rate of all of the confidence intervals that you might um, draw in the future rather than any particular interval um, that you have. And so the diff main difference is that you really can um, interpret this credible interval as the plausibility of um, your parameters is falling between X and Y. Um, does that make sense? Yep. All right. Um, and so another thing to consider when constructing your credible intervals um, is that um, do you want to report the middle 95% of posterior plausible values? Um, in other words, do you want to report the CI where half of the credible values are above your central tendency, so your mean, median, or mode, and half of the values are above it? Um, because that might not make sense if you say, if say you have um, a more skewed distribution. And even though um, the distributions we see here are only slightly skewed, um, they are a bit noticeable and will probably work with distributions in which they're very like right tail skewed or log normal distributions. And so in that case, if your posterior is non-symmetric, um, the values included in the upper end of the credible interval um, could be less plausible than the lower values as an example. Um, and so the alternative is to use a um, highest posterior density region. Um, so in contrast to the credible interval for pi that uses the middle of the distribution, um, the 95% HPD contains 95% of values that are, most, that are more probable than values outside the region. Um, and I guess this is something that, um, well, I guess it's pretty intuitive. Is it, does that make sense to everyone? Yep, at least for me. All right. Yep. Um, all right, cool. Um, so the HPD should also be noted um, isn't always different, um, especially you know if your distribution is normal or is some sort of symmetric distribution. Um, but generally, at least in papers, I see that this is um, the one that's um, often reported. Um, but you can let me know if that differs based on the field. Um, my realm of psychology, um, I see this is being reported more often. All right, so that covers the estimation section. So where we tried to estimate plausible values of our parameter pi. Um, now we're gonna go into hypothesis testing, which st still involves um, getting our estimate, but looking at um, how probable it is um, in light of um, our hypothesis. If I can just add one point that the bug doesn't cover, but I think could be maybe important, at least like, for example, in epidemiology or field like that, they are sometimes interested in the distribution, for example, of one very particular value for, let's say zero, because zero is, even if it's, uh, so sometimes they're just interested by the percentage of zero. So you can also calculate that with the whole distribution, which you cannot not necessarily do easily with a frequentist um, 
uh, methods. I don't know if it makes sense because in estimation, usually currently we are playing a lot with the, um, the mean or the mod and some way of estimating the spread of the distribution. But sometimes what you are interested also can be like, uh, because let's say, yeah, like the percentage of people who, are not been, who have not been affected is something mm -hmm. that maybe you want to get. And it's kind of difficult to have in other like uh, in the frequentist approach because you don't have the whole distribution. You, don't, you are not uh, necessarily producing it. So this is one part, like, because we uh, work with all the distribution, I mean, at least the posterior in estimation of the posterior distribution, you can produce other kind of statistics or estimation than just the, um, than just the um, classical summary one, let's say. Mm -hmm. I think this is one of the strong points, like, I don't know if it's happened in your field, in psychology, like, maybe you can be interested in something related to the distribution that's not the mean and um, in quantile let's say but you can do it with the posterior distribution right okay that's uh, it <laughs> sorry oh no no worries um yeah and we'll talk more about um contrasting um bayesian versus frequentist stats in the last section anyways um so cool. it's a good primer for us um especially um, compared to null hypothesis significance testing, that specific branch of frequentism, I find that um, Bayesian stats is definitely more one intuitive and, as you said, um, more flexible in terms of the information it can give you. Um, yeah, so we'll move to um, hypothesis testing and start with one-sided tests. Um, I assume we've all been trained within um, the frequentist tradition, so we're probably familiar with one versus two-sided tests, um, but we're still going to cover what exactly that entails. So suppose we read this claim in an article um, that fewer than 20% of museum artists are Gen X or younger. Um, this seems plausible given our posterior PEF and our credible intervals. However, how can we test this hypothesis that will formalize as um, pi is less than 0.2? So the answer is to calculate the posterior probability, um, which is the shaded area under the posterior um, PDF or probability density function. Um, and so based on this um, posterior distribution, so beta of 1892, um, the probability that pi is below 0.2 is represented um, here and it's around 85%. Um, so this procedure of hypothesis testing can be formalized um, as having a null hypothesis and an alternative. Um, so the null here would be at least 20% of artists are Gen X. So this is the status quo, or typically the thing we're trying to disprove. And the alternative is the thing that usually our claim or what we're trying to find evidence for. In this case, um, that the number of artists that are Gen X or younger is below 20%. So this is represented here. Um, this is a one-sided test because our alternative hypothesis claims that pi lies on one side of 0.2, um, as shown also in this distribution. This is our um, alternative, or yeah, this is all our, our whole alternative hypothesis, rather than just being different from 0.2, in which case it would be um, written like this, that pi is a 0.2. Um, so in terms of conducting this hypothesis test, um, we're probably familiar with the logic of the one-sided test from frequentism, but um, the steps for getting our base factor to do this test is a bit different under Bayesian stats. So the first step is to calculate the posterior odds, um, which is an odds ratio of the alternative to the null um, that's shown here. Um, and should also be noted that um, this is just the posterior probability um, divided by one minus the posterior probability, since one minus the posterior is um, uh, is the plausibility of the null, I believe. And so um, that gives us an odds of 5.6. And so once we have this posterior odds um, and shown in the diagram here on the right, the next is to calculate the prior odds. Um, and so we use a similar formula, except we're using our priors. Um, 
And so the uh, prior plausibility or prior probability of the alternative to the null um, here equals um, 0.09 um, in this example. Um, and this reflects that um, we weren't awfully confident um, in our alternative hypothesis that um, less than 20% of artists are Gen Xers. Um, and then once we have those two values, now we can finally calculate the base factor, um, which is, again, another um, odds ratio, or I guess a likelihood um, ratio of the posterior to the prior odds. Um, and now that we have that, um, which is dividing posterior by the prior odds, um, we now have our base factor, which comes out to 60.02. Uh, um, I tend to glance over the formulas because, well, one, um, it's mainly done for us. And I think this idea of working with odds ratio is pretty much throughout this whole process is pretty intuitive. Um, but does that make sense to everyone? Yeah. Yep. OK, cool. And so now that we have this base factor 60, um, we interpret this as um, sort of the update of how um, how much more plausible our posterior our odds are than our prior. Um, and so the textbook, um, oh, and so to be more specific, um, our hypothesis about Gen Xers is roughly 60 times higher than the prior odds. Um, so how do we interpret this Bayes factor? Well, I can say that at least um, from a lot of the literature, this is a pretty high Bayes factor. Um, but some general guidelines are is that if the base factor is one, um, that the plausibility of the alternative didn't change in light of the observed data. If it's greater than one, then the plausibility of the alternative increased after observing the data. And so this counts as more convincing evidence in favor of the alternative. And if it's less than one, um, then it's decreased. The, the plausibility of the alternative has decreased. Um, and again, just like an odds ratio, it has the same interpretation. At least I keep falling back to that because that's what I learned first. Um, but I guess as a side note too, um, there are various cutoffs that have been proposed for what counts as a good um, base factor, whether a base factor of 10 or above constitutes pretty good evidence or not. Uh, the textbook notes that um, it can depend on the context. So maybe it depends on the study. Um, and it might depend on, um, yeah, what you consider to be um, good evidence. Maybe five times higher in one context is better than another. Um, and so I think people like um, Harold Jeffries um, and Raftery have proposed certain cutoffs, just like, you know, the point P.05 cutoff, um, but that this might vary by field. Um, I'm actually not familiar with what currently accepted practices are in like various areas of the literature. Um, but feel free to chime in if, if you know, like, for example, in your field, um, if they're typical. It's, uh, typically, bias is pretty, very not used in my field. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah. We are all doing p value. Mm -hmm. Yeah, same here. I've never had to work out the base factor for a paper. Yeah, and that's fair. I guess we don't, it's hard to know what exactly the cutoffs are if they're never used in the first place. So that's a. Yeah, I mean, it's not even p-value, just count the star. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, exactly. One, two, or three stars. Um, yes, that's it. Yeah. Um, and even then, I would love to see, because that has a lot of nuance too, right? I don't think p-values count as the same type of index of evidence like base factors are. Um, but still, I would love to see articles um, justify what their alpha level is instead of going to a default. Um, but anyways. Apply an issue that applies to Bayes and um, frequentism, as you can see. Yeah, I think odds like uh, is some kind of intuitive way also because like if you think about it, you can use odds a lot of time in common practice. Like let's say in the statistic world, like you can count the odds of something. The odds can be like uh, maybe like a good idea like to to bring people into that. I don't know. Could I? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think so. Um, yeah, at least when I was learning this for the first time, um, it, it definitely um, makes more sense to me. Um, although when you go on the internet, I'll just note that a lot of people define base factors as um, just comparing the plausibility of your alternative to your null. 
that doesn't seem to be exactly the same as comparing the the odds of your posterior to your prior um yeah but i, I um, think yeah you're, you're right this is some things that have been at least the uh it's in yeah statisticians are debating this they are i mean they are doing the statistician job i assume uh there is like a podcast the about um, just the, this Bayesian podcast. At one time, they have done something with Bayesian fa factor. For, so there, there was this statistician professor. This, the one who was leading the JASP. I don't know if you know oh, yeah. JASP. Yeah, it's uh, by Eric Jan Wagenmakers, right? That yeah, that's him. And he's very, uh, very like into defending bias factor. So mm -hmm. if you want to learn more, like you can, I think, as I listen to this podcast, uh, or read this paper. Yeah, it's the podcast by Alex and Dora. Is that right? It's, yeah. I would recommend it. Yeah, with the rap at the beginning. I love it. Um, <laughs> sorry for context, Lisa. I don't know if you know the podcast, but um, it always opens with this guy rapping about Bayesian stats. So it's, and yeah. the content is good too. Please, please share in the chat. I, yeah, I don't know about it. <laughs> okay. We can add uh, that later. Oh, yeah, we'll do, do it, do it, because in the chat, like after it's stay on the log, so it's good. For sure, yeah. It's a I'm on mobile, so I will not do it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay, I'll make a note. Um, okay, so, um, so I guess where we left off. Um, so this is what the base factor is. Yeah. And so this procedure can be easily carried and is carried over to two-sided tests. Um, so I guess the need to distinguish one-sided versus two-sided tests is that um, specifying your null and your alternative hypotheses is a bit different. And that's simply because we can't specify um, an exact um, point null hypothesis and try to calculate the posterior or prior odds. And the reason for that is that, um, as we know, under any continuous distribution, the probability of getting any one number is zero, right? Just because um, there are infinitely many values under a continuous distribution. Um, I've sort of assumed that we're familiar with that. Um, there's a great I, video on this, it's called a probability paradox sometimes, um, but the basic consequence is um, if the probability of your null hypothesis is zero, um, <laughs> you end up running into some problems. Um, yeah, you can't you can't you can't estimate a, a, um, an area for a line. Exactly. Yeah, that's line, is, well. line doesn't have like this this level. Of, line have, don't have this dimension. Mm -hmm. It's yeah. one dimension object. Yeah, exactly. Um, and so, um, in light of that, um, actually, before we talk too much about that, I have a quiz here. Um, again, <laughs> copied from the textbook. <laughs> So recall that, um, oh, actually, I don't know if I revealed the answers. Give it here. All right. So recall that 95% posterior credible interval for R pi is 0.1 to 0.24. And does this uh, CI provide evidence that pi differs from 0.3? Tum, 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 tum. Lisa, Lisa. <laughs> <laughs> I thought, I, I thought people were not being called out today. Okay, okay, okay. Yeah, okay. yeah. <laughs> that wasn't me, that was Olivia. <laughs> okay, my bad, my bad. It's okay. I don't mind no, seeing a bit kidding, of awkward silence. Um, no, um, um, so is it is it similar to frequentists where it's like, they're like non-overlapping intervals sort yeah, of could much. provide evidence yeah. for, okay. It is. So, so, so yes. <laughs> yeah. I mean, you're right about that. Um, yes, it does. Um, so the hypothesized value of pi under the null um, is outside the posterior credible interval, as Lisa mentioned. Um, similar um, interpretation to confidence intervals to see if they overlap with zero um, under that frequentism framework. Um, as a sort of a side note, um, we can also claim that H null, um, so our prediction of point or our hypothesis of point three is substantially different um, from our posterior credible interval. If we specify before um, doing the analysis 
that a difference of 0.05 counts as a substantial difference beforehand. Um, the textbook mentions this, um, I guess, just because um, you can specify and try to justify what counts as a um, theoretically or practically significant um, difference or effect size in this case, right? Um, yeah, I mean, I hesitate to call this sort of thing an effect size, um, but yeah, this effect, this difference. Um, and so if you specify that beforehand, um, say 0.05, we can say that's substantially different. Um, and so now that we have these ranges for H null and the alternative, so that we specify here, um, we can calculate the posterior odds, the prior odds, and the base factor, um, just like we did for the one-sided test. Um, we won't go through th those same steps again, um, but it's the same procedure, except for two-sided tests. The takeaway here is that we're specifying a range of values um, around our null hypothesis. So even though it was originally 0.3, um, in order to get these prior and posterior odds, um, we have to specify a range between 0.25 and 0.35 as an example. Um, all right, and so that covers the hypothesis testing uh, component. Um, and now the next step is to look at posterior predictions or generating predictions from our um, posterior distribution. Um, and this is something, I mean, I guess you can also do it in a um, frequentist framework, um, but I like that um, a lot of Bayesians seem to emphasize this um, uh, prediction aspect as well, not just um, making inferences or not just hypothesis testing. Um, so for another quiz, Suppose we get our hands on data um, for, 20, uh, for 20 more artworks displayed at the museum. So we have this new sample of 20 paintings or artworks. Um, based on the posterior understanding of pi um, that we've developed throughout this chapter, what number would you predict are done by artists that are Gen X or younger? And so I'll propose to you an answer and you can tell me why it's wrong. And so one way, would be to use the posterior mean, which is 16%, or around three out of 20 artists will be Gen Xers in this next sample. Um, so what's wrong with this approach? I realize the answers are like literally right there. <laughs> so I want to entertain me. Um, yeah, actually, there's no point. All right, so it's to, so the problem with this is that it's a point prediction, right? Um, and I guess there's nothing, um, that's really wrong per se, but it could be done better is how I would phrase it, because we want to ac account for two main sources of variability. The first is the sampling variability in the data. Um, so when we randomly sample 20 artists, um, even if the true value um, or the true proportion is 16%, um, just by sampling variability alone, um, we might not get that with each sample. Um, it'll fluctuate depending on which one we happen to draw. And then the second source of variability, and I think this is where the power of Bayesian stats really comes in, is that there's an emphasis on the variability in our unknown parameter, in this case, pi. Um, so our posterior variability in pi. Um, so 16% isn't the only um, posterior plausible value of pi, as we saw in our credible intervals, right? It could range from 0.1 to 0.24. Um, and so because of this uncertainty, when making predictions about the 20 new artworks, we need to consider what outcomes we'd expect to see under each possible pie, while accounting for the fact that some pies are also more plausible than others. So at least when you, you know, start thinking about all these sources of uncertainty or variability um, and how to account for that mathematically, um, at least for me, it can seem a bit overwhelming, but thankfully this stuff has already been figured out for us. And so, Conditioned on pi, the randomness or sampling variability in y, um, so this is our sample of 20 artists, it can be modeled um, with this distribution or can be modeled by y given um, pi following this binomial distribution um, with this probability density function um, that we've learned before, um, just the usual binomial distribution. Um, and in this case, y prime is the unknown number, or at least for now, the unknown number of 20 new artworks that are created by Gen Xers. Um, 
For an overall understanding of how many of the next 20 artists will be Gen X, we have to combine our probability density function of pi given our data. Um, so, sorry, I was reading out of line here. Um, so to this end, weighting um, the function of our data given pi by the posterior probability density function um, to capture the chance of observing um, y prime, um, which are the Gen Xers for a given pi, while taking into account the posterior plausibility of that pi value. Um, that wasn't explained very well, um, but hopefully, I think as I go further into this, um, it might make sense how we combine um, these sources of variability. Um, so the posterior predictive model of Y prime, which is the number of the 20 new artists that are Gen X, is the posterior predictive probability mass function that calculates the overall chance of observing um, the number of um, artists that are Gen Xers across all possible pi's from zero to one by averaging across the above equation. So this tells us the chance of observing um, a certain number of Gen Xers in our sample for any given pi. Um, and that can be done through this equation. Again, um, things that all more or less gloss over, but anyone here is welcome to chime in to try and either break down parts of the equation and how they correspond with what we're trying to do here. Um, and I think this will be demonstrated with code later. Um, but I'll try to break it down in words as best as I can, um, what this exactly is doing and what this integral is doing. Um, so the overall chance of observing y prime, it weights the chance of observing this outcome um, under any possible pi by the posterior um, plausibility um, of this function of pi. Um, I suppose it's one of those things that's better if you read it on your own time. Um, but that basically the takeaway here is that we're trying to um, account for, this is the formula that tries to account for that um, sampling variability and that um, posterior um, parameter variability over here. Um, so I would say that's what you need to take away with all the words I've been saying. Um, so now that we've constructed a posterior predictive model, um, or a probability density function for pi, we can get an exact formula for the PMF um, of our data um, or of our sample. Um, this allows us to plug in different values of Y prime um, to estimate the probability of observing, say, three Gen Xers out of the next 20 artists. And so we just plug that in um, to our probability mass function. And so for this example, um, the probability of observing three out of 20 would be around 22%. Um, but what if we have other questions about our posterior probability? So as you can imagine, um, we could make other types of predictions, right? So what's the posterior probability that, that at least five of the 20 artists are Gen X? Um, or how many of the next 20 artists do we expect to be Gen X? Um, or in other words, what's the average? Um, so it's tedious to answer these questions because one, there are no readily built-in formulas for R to analyze these features. Um, and also for more complicated um, models that say have many parameters, um, it may not be as easy as just using a probability mass function or solving it analytically. And so um, we could answer in our toy examples because it's a pretty simple you know, binomial distribution we could answer the first question of having at least five of the 20 artists with the following formula. So this is um, adding up the PMF evaluated at each of the 16 Y values that are in this range. Um, and so from five all the way to 20, um, or to calculate the expected number um, of the next 20 artists that are Gen Xers, we can obtain the posterior weighted average of all possible Y values. Um, but as we'll cover in the next section, um, with more complicated models, or even with these um, simpler models, um, we don't have to do it analytically or with these equations um, when we can simulate it with MCMC. Um, is everything okay so far? Anything I, I know this section was a bit messy for me, um, but is there anything that 
I can either go back on or that you like to add on to? Nope, it's good. Okay. All right, cool. Um, so then the next section, um, and we're almost at the end here. So this is, um, I think, will it become most useful to all of us because for any models that will practically run, it'll have to be approximated with um, MCMC or simulation, right? And so we learned in the last chapter, um, thanks again, Olivier, for covering, um, that we can approximate posteriors with MCMC methods. And then um, that's nice for posterior analyses because then we could use the Markov chain sample values um, to approximate any of these posterior features, whether it's you know the expected value, the median, the mode, or something else. Um, and so first, we'll um, we'll create this value, or we'll create our model and simulate it with our stand. Um, and so this is the code for the binomial model we've been talking about this entire time, um, with four chains, um, and I believe five thousand iterations, but with 5,000 burn-in sample, if I'm reading this right. Um, and then um, looking at our MCMC diagnostics, which visually look good. pretty good. Um, and then our autocorrelation looks pretty good. All things that we've covered in the previous two chapters. And so now that we've done all this, you know, our diagnostics look pretty good. Um, now that we have all these samples, um, we can get into estimation and hypothesis testing. And so for this example, we have 20,000 Markov chain values um, that we use to approximate our posterior, or in this case, our beta 1892 posterior. Um, and we can see that our MCMC posterior closely approximates the actual one. Um, Oh, actually, we can't. Yeah, OK. So this is the one we use yeah, both. Are all of our MCMC samples. And this one is the actual one. And so we can see when you look at the true pi value, we're like sort of the center of the distribution. It's uh, similar for both. Um, yeah. And so um, now we can approximate any feature of the beta 1892 posterior model with the samples we just simulated. Um, for example, we can approximate the posterior mean with the mean of the MCMC sample values, or we could approximate the 2.5th um, posterior percentile by the 2.5th percentile of the MCMC sample values um, that we show here. And then we can use this um, say to estimate pi or to um, get our credible or 95% credible um, intervals. Um, and this is um, just taking the 2.5th and 97.5th percentile and again our MCMC samples. And as just a proof of concept, um, these are the true uh, mean mode and, percent and percentiles. Um, and this is the MCMC approximation, which um, which um, is pretty close to it. And for the final section, um, we'll talk about um, posterior prediction with our Markov chain values. Um, and so again, we can approximate um, our posterior predictive model of Y prime. So predicting um, of the next 20 artists, um, how many are Gen X or younger. Um, and so again, we can also account for this sampling variability and posterior variability in pi. Um, to capture both sources of variability, um, we can use the um, our binome or generate random numbers from a binomial distribution to simulate um, one outcome um, from each of the 20,000 um, pi chain values. And so that's demonstrated here um, with our art chains um, data frame object. Um, and then we can um, use this to create a histogram to look at um, to or to get our predictions for y. And so we see most of them are around um, three. And so that's what our prediction might be. Um, so the resulting collection of 20,000 predictions closely approximates the true posterior predictive distribution. And it's likely that three of the 20 artists will be Gen X or younger um, in our sample. Um, Although it can plausibly range from zero to 10, it should be added. Um, so we can utilize the posterior predictive sample to approximate features 
of the actual posterior predictive model that were burdensome to specify mathematically. Um, so they can approximate the mean uh, prediction um, and the more comprehensive uh, posterior prediction interval for Y prime. Um, so we still expect roughly three of the next 20 artists to be Gen X or younger, um, but there's an 80% chance that this figure is somewhere between one and six artists. Um, and we can show that here in R code with the summarize function. Um, yeah, that's displayed here. Finally, this will take just a minute. So contrasting, as we've talked about throughout this discussion, uh, Bayesian versus frequentist stats. So once we build or simulate our posterior model, um, the process of estimation, hypothesis testing, or prediction, um, it can be more intuitive um, compared to the analogous frequentist calculations. And so um, I think one big takeaway for me is that in Bayesian analysis, we assess the uncertainty of unknown parameters given some observed data. Um, in contrast, frequentism tends to assess the uncertainty of the observed data given some assumed parameter values. Or another way of saying all this is that um, Bayesians treat the parameters as random and the data as fixed. Um, and frequentists treat the data as random and they tend to treat the parameters as fixed. Um, and so the frequentist um, interpretation can be a bit backwards to assume the data are random um, when we have our data right there, right, that are fixed. Um, but it's the parameters um, that we really don't know and that have really the uncertainty that we want to quantify. And so since we like to ask, how probable is my hypothesis? Um, this might better correspond um, with um, a Bayesian framework by looking around the uncertainty of a parameter, example, pi. In contrast, p-values um, in a frequentist framework um, look at how probable is my data if my hypothesis weren't true. Um, this logic is a bit more confusing and less relevant because, I mean, I'm sure we can all relate to this. When you're learning about p-values, it's you know, the probability of observing your effect or something more extreme under the assumption that the null hypothesis is true. Um, but instead, why not test how consistent your hypothesis are with your theory rather than how inconsistent they are with um, a hypothesis you don't really care about? And so um, that's the last bit of Bayesian propaganda that was found at the end of this textbook, but I think it's um, quite an appealing argument personally. Um, yeah, and so that's all I have. I think I finished just on the dot. Um, hopefully, um, by the end of this, I mean, you might need to reread it if I didn't explain it well. Um, <laughs> um, hopefully, like just off the top of your head, since these are pretty, I would say, fundamental concepts, you'll be able to define posterior estimation, the procedure of hypothesis testing, and um, posterior prediction. Um, and that's all I have. So thank you both. Well, thank you. No, thank you. That was great. Yeah, it was great. Thank you. No, it, it was very clear. I, I'm glad you enjoyed the markdown and so you can like you know do a more chapter soon. Yeah, yeah these, <laughs> book, these book clubs. <laughs> yeah, I'll try, I'll try my best. Um, yeah, they've taught me a lot of different skills um, using markdown and book down being one of them. So yeah, it's great. Yeah, even if markdown like kind of you know like people are all jumping on quarto, whatever, it's like markdown still great and work. I mean, I've heard. Sometimes, like uh, you know, developer you probably know like the the catching phrase: developer develop more developers. I mean, yeah, yeah. Uh, so like they always need to provide new stuff, but yeah, so. that's true. Yeah, I don't know if you guys are on Twitter, but I'm following the R Studio conference, and yeah, the one of the big, <laughs> one of the big things is Quarto is all the rage. R Studio changing in their name, obviously. The yeah. positive. Um, but yeah. Python. Yeah. Yeah, I mean it's fine. I mean, at the end, I think. Well, I don't know. I would probably should. I should probably be more successful if I was better at Python. I guess because mm. this is in the market, it's way more like marketable. <laughs> yeah, well, especially if you're looking for data science positions. Yeah, I've heard in the industry, Python's more depends. Used. But yeah, but yeah. like the for example, for what we are doing, the package, uh, the, the package, it's, the package on Python is SciPy. It's a great package. Like I will not uh, argue against it, but uh, I found the method, like for example, like the, let's say, like you want like the, the, 
the PNOM or whatever. It will be in SciPy, I think the, it will be no, uh, like the norm, the parameters, points, the method with CD, uh, PDF. You will uh, add a method to the function to uh, get the, what you want. Uh, I don't know. I think like quick function are a bit better. Uh, at least in a data analysis workflow. I will add like, if you are like making more like software, I think it makes more sense to have like, uh, when you can spend more time in a script that you will not be opening, you know, it will just like, uh, you will just call it like with whatever and it will run. Instead of doing um, an analysis, you kind of want to go backward and then quicker it is, better it is. I don't know. <laughs> I mean, more it follows easily your workflow, better it is. But if, you're, if you are good with a workflow in Pi, and if it's not like bothering you, like, I don't know, uh, if it's quick enough, I think it's good. This is what it's important. To my point of view, when you are doing an analysis, quicker it is, better it is. I mean, less uh, obstacle between what you want to do. And um, so, yeah, but anyway, yes. Everyone should be Python man now. No, I, I, I get that sentiment, um, especially, yeah, as I said, in industry, a lot of people are using Python. But for me, the thing that R has going for it is like one, this community. I feel like this community, whether it's our book clubs or just on Twitter, is just so much more powerful and inclusive that it's just much more encouraging. Yeah. Plus, I think like the data manipulation, the tidyverse, these tools are just things that I've um, become so accustomed to and comfortable with so yeah no. I, myself I i think yeah it's the, the community is a very good point i think yeah. so um yeah it's i think it's very important because um it's also like you cannot be a specialist of everything and even if you are a specialist you need to talk to people so if people are more open-minded it's become easier i think mm -hmm. And then like, um, but for example, in spatial data, you do not have like uh, Air Einla, uh, integrated nested Laplace approximation. Uh, it's mm -hmm. like some kind of Bayesian framework, but not with uh, MCMC. Oh, it's okay. a hierarchical model that use like normal distribution at, at one point to not doing MCMC. And it doesn't exist for the moment in Python. And it's very used like in, uh, in spatial and, N time series also. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. I would say like you still have some advantages doing air, but <laughs> I mean, like my current pipelines have SQL R and Python. I, I, there isn't a thing that yeah. only has one or another at the moment. Also, I, I guess it depends on where they keep your data and how they keep your data. But like it is a huge pain to write a SQL data based back from R. Basically, oh. like I just port it to uh, like a data asset or an S3 bucket, and then I write it from Python back in because yeah. I don't think there's a way to do it yet. So yeah, anyway, I, I think all of it is, is kind of like all over the place still. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, we are still like, this is, this is still a, you're right. Like there is like also getting data and for that. And like there is field where Python make more sense like computer vision, um like remote sensing every still like i think like when you you need to go a bit deeper in particular data structure because like currently like we are playing in the tidyverse way of doing it which is a table which is a very convenient way of organizing data and very easy way um also to represent it but a lot of data are not like that there's just, just a string of vectors a string of whatever's and uh, like images for example so, and then in, in, and when you, you want like more particular structure of data, maybe Python's, which is more related to um, computer science, help you to encode that better and then retrieve that better also. I don't know. <laughs> anyway, it was good. So next week with presenting. <laughs> Is it me again? Oh, I don't know. That's next week. I mean, we can ask on the chat and, and delay, delay a bit this consideration, but. But what is next week's chapter again? Please remind me. Uh, 
uh, Bayesian regression, right? Oh, that's the beginning. It's an important one. Okay. That's sad. All right. I'm moving next week, so I don't think I'll be, but. Good luck. Thank you. Well, let me check first. I can. Preliminary. Okay. You know, the people who weren't here, maybe will feel guilty and do it. Okay? Uh, okay. <laughs> that will be my strategy. All right. All right. Yeah. It's if, a if no one... Oh, really? <laughs> okay. Yeah, something like in pages, like, oh no, are around 20, 22 to 23 pages. So, okay. 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 If no one, no one, yeah, picks up the page, then I, I guess Currently, I, could I don't do it. think. Anyway, I will. I will ask. I will ask on the chat letters uh, probably on Friday, hoping okay. to get someone. All right. Thank you. Well, it was good. Thanks. Yep. Thank you, everyone. Yeah, this is and, fun. And uh, oh yeah, I just wanted to add points. Like it's true. Like maybe you are. We are a bit like bad for frequentists. I will just say that when the method was developed, uh, it was like 100 years ago. You know. Uh, and it was like related to, I think it came in a particular context, uh, the all the frequentist um, methods. Like, for example, uh, I think they work in that most of the data came from agronomy, you know, when you can yeah, like stops, divide, yeah. divide like a field um, and reproduce an experiment. So the frequentist approach in the field that's supposed to be homogeneous with the kind of plans that weren't cloned, but were, were very homogeneous in the um, diverse g genome diversity, et cetera, et cetera. So, you know, they were like kind of maybe, and they were, had also less powerful computer, obviously. Uh, so I don't know. I think like the book, I understand currently the needs to move to bias. I think it's a good move because like the question we have, are not the same that we had or the same people that had in agronomy in the beginning of the 19th centuries. But that, that I just wanted like to just defend a bit, like be a bit devil advocate on, on them saying like, <laughs> I think it was like also related to their context. You know, they didn't create that uh, without any context. So, but I'm not enough uh, smart and good enough in history of statistics to to do it, but just that's it. <laughs> no, I think it's a good point. And just to briefly add on to that, because I know we're over time, I linked yeah. a blog to Deborah Mayo's um, website or a link to her website. Um, she's a, I would say, a pretty good defender of frequentist stats. Um, her cool. and Daniel Lackins, I would say, are the big names um, that define how, you know, it's very good for controlling your long run error rates. And um, so, yeah, if you want to check that cool. out. Cool. I, I will definitely check it. Yeah. yeah. Well, uh, good moving for you, Brendan, and I hope everything is fine in your part, Liza, and see you next week. Yep. All right. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye.